Thank you very much, uh, especially for allowing this very rare <laughs> occasion for an interdisciplinary conversation, as we were saying before. And I'm, uh, I feel very honored um, of, of talking <laughs> about the social science and humanities field. I think we are also a minority, so for me it's very important that we have this voice, and especially that we do it in dialogue and conversation with other disciplines. So thank you very much for, for this opportunity. And um, as a historian of the European integration process, I'm all always really intrigued about the ways um, in which we can approach the idea of charging the intangible, because that's what we do. I mean, from the humanities, we have all these intangible sources and ways of approaching them. So today I will try to convey the idea of how can we do that through two dimensions that I think they are really common to all possible scientific disciplines, which are space on time. And I will dedicate more time to space because this is more my current project. And I will just touch upon time at the very end. And I brought today this, this image by John Holcroft showing this tree, the idea of um, the languages of the mind. And the tree, I mean, the, <laughs> the tree itself has this space as a projection and time as the intimate roots. And this is also very, something very important for my research because I, I study the external dimensions of human mobility rights, that would be my projection. And then I, try, I study also time perception, temporalities, and, um, as, and philosophy of time as a way of going back to these intimate roots. And uh, thinking of this quotation by E.O. Uh, Wilson, and, and in which he speaks about how in these early stages, when you are just launching a new research project of creation of both art and science, everything in your mind is a story. So this is also very much related to my own research. Historians, we are storytellers. And in this uh, first approach to a space in which I <clears throat> study the, um, the history of human mobility rights in the European Union, starting from the mid eighties, from the launch of the Schengen Agreements and the creation of a setting that really <laughs> makes what we're doing today possible, which is the creation of the free movement of persons uh, within the Schengen area, so fundamental right of rights. Uh, this is the, the main the main question I have. As a historian, I have um, also a, a, a slogan, a personal slogan, which is looking back in order to see beyond. So I would like to invite you to this story today, looking back into the roots and the challenges of building these uh, human mobility rights, this idea of having a free movement of persons and not just a free movement of capitals, goods and services in the European Union. So in order to do that, I conduct a lot of interviews with the architects of this process. And I also go to many different archives. I will talk about that in a minute. But uh, if I would have to explain what I find in these archives, when I try to look back in order to see vision and understand how can we build this fundamental right to have rights of our own mobility as, of, as human beings, I, this is something very difficult to explain. So I thought, okay, today maybe I will explain my main archival findings through art. And this is a painting by Brazilian Canadian artist, Rob Gonzalez, and it shows here an architecture an infrastructure that becomes a vehicle of possibility. And this is an idea that I find again and again in, in archival collections, which is the notion of space as a vehicle in European integration. And not just a limiting, but an enabling model. But at least that was the hope of those players interested in human mobility rights and the free movement of persons as an end in itself. Maybe not just as a way of getting, for instance, a single market for the European community and so on. So this has conditions and potentialities. And what I do through the history of concepts and through a critical discourse analysis is studying the concept of solidarity, how it evolves through time as this vehicle of possibility, as a vision in the making. And my aim is precisely to empower citizens, to empower residents, to empower societies, because the more we know about who was there as initiatives and proposals, but something we have forgotten in terms of human mobility rights in our present, especially regarding uh, our approach to migration policy or asylum policies and so on. I think this is something empowering. So this power has also 
a lot to do with the idea of the ductility of our age of disruption. And this is the reason why I brought these this quotations that reflect also many thoughts and many ideas I, I keep on finding on, on my archival research. For instance, Harry Melville talks about how our actions run as causes and they come back to us as effects. And also, you know, Diaz talks about this notion that the only way out is in this introspection. So that's why I work in this <laughs> ways backward to history to empower ourselves in the present regarding the very difficult decisions and policy making about these very sensitive areas which touch upon fundamental rights and fundamental freedoms. So in this age of disruption, we have this ability, we have this power, but all these issues of human mobility rights, they really touch upon questions of identity. They are really fundamental, they are visceral. And some of them are what have we forgotten? Also, how did we talk about that in the past? And at the same time, what have we lost of whom we wish to become as global interconnected societies in the making? And in order to, to try to find answers to these big questions of identity, I especially visited these archives. These are the historical archives of the European Parliament in Luxembourg. And I, I will be mainly bringing examples of the European Parliament today because it was very critical of other European institutions in this crafting and drafting of human mobility rights and the creation of free movement of persons. I, I also visited the historical archives of the European Union in Florence, and in the, during the last two years I was in the United States working in the um, EU delegation to the US collection, which is preserved at the University of Pittsburgh. I can tell you more about the archives afterwards, but I also wanted to bring some examples, some excerpts of things that we have maybe forgotten that can be useful for our present challenges. And some of them, I mean, we could even consider them as roads not taken that maybe we could recover. Here I brought you an answer by a member of the parliament, Marie-Claude Bissat, who talked at this, the very beginning of this process of the creation of the free movement of persons since 1985. And very significantly, this was launched when Simone Weil was the president of the European parliament. And there was this whole initiative about the people's Europe that would become a citizen's Europe. So, this member of the parliament stated that we want to build Europe for the women and men who live here, hence for all citizens and residents. We think this very original sense of inclusive community building. And for me, this is very interesting because it deeply resonates with this we the people kind of ingredient, which is part of the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I consider that very important. And then in 1986, there was this very significant document, which is called the Solemn Declaration by the Free Institutions in the European Communities. And the European Parliament debates, they, they were part of this very heated and contentious discussions about um, fundamental rights and human mobility rights. So those debates stated how um, immigrants contribute to enrich the diversity of Europe and how there was this need to promote their integration in society, fighting against any form of discrimination, racism, or xenophobia, and positively valuing the contribution of these migrants to the building of a multicultural and multinational Europe. So just as an example of many things that we maybe have forgotten. And solidarity aspects come back very strongly with the launch of the Schengen, um, Schengen Convention, sorry, in the, at the beginning of the 1990s. And um, here I brought you another example of um, a document for the historical archives that was consulting from the member of the Parliament, Paul Trip, who was one of the main rapporteurs in the creation of this free movement of persons in the European Union that we came to know then. So what was stated at that time was that by lumping together legal and illegal immigration, we place this systematic suspicion, suspicion of guilt on migrants and how this can awake some many forms of violence. And at the same time, how human rights must not be a matter of variable geometry, they are universal and immutable, and they are not to be interpreted in one way for a period of economic expansion, and in another way for a time of recession. So, so many things that we forget. And 
there is something else that I keep finding through time in all these archival documents, which is this liberty versus security uh, debates. And um, something that brings us back to this uh, very famous consideration by Benjamin Franklin. And at the same time, it talks about this growing tension between a democratic mindset based on the protection, the guarantee, and the implementation of fundamental freedoms and rights on the one hand, and this um, growing worldview, which is based on overarching notions of surveillance, security, and control, what we normally call today the securitization of migration, for instance. So as a conclusion to this first uh, project on space and its expressions regarding human mobility rights, there are some conclusions I found also in this archival research that are really illuminating and could be helpful for the present. And one of them is the, the calls uh, on behalf of the European Parliament at the time for the substitution of the notion of surveillance and control by that of responsibility. And then the search for a balance between fundamental freedoms and rights and a non-discriminatory and non-exclusive safety. They also make this peace solidarity connection that I find very interesting because they explain that peace is not just the presence of security and the absence of conflict. They indicate that there's also a community building element that should never be forgotten, but maybe something to recover as well. And there's also a big movement against what we call also today the Fortress Europe and the willingness to succeed in a hopefully a particular version of European integration that is devoted to transform a stumbling blocks uh, into stepping stones. So that's the hope. And now very briefly, I would also like to talk um, about temporalities and the time I mentioned in my work. This goes back into the past 10 years that I have been researching on time and the instillment of time perception in the communication strategy of the European Commission um, at the end of the Cold War regarding the Israel judgment. The European Union. So here I work with a concept which I call the illusion of neutral time. And it, it has to do with this very fundamental question as human society that we have about the fact that if we want to just be the result of the past or do we want to be the cause of the future? So it's something very, an invitation to be proactive as, as researchers as well. And from that point of view, it's something very interesting that I was finding also in archival research regarding this question was the idea that the 90s were a bridge between eras and not that much of a new beginning. And maybe this uh, issue is coming back at us very strongly in the present as well. And also how time perceptions instilled, for instance, by the European Communi uh, Commission communication strategy on this Israel enlargement of the European Union was a contextual. And this a contextuality in, in time, it uh, created a very famous and very impactful detachment between European citizens and institutions. So there was this very important idea about returning to Europe, the return to Europe of Central and Eastern um, European countries. So, so the problem that is um, expressed in, in many of these oral history interviews I conduct and many archival documents is that once that this so-called agenda is exhausted, there could be the, the need for a new meaningful and compelling driving force for the EU's external dimension and the definition of its role in the global arena. So we are still at that, and that's, that has been very problematic and is more problematic even now. So maybe what they propose in these documents and interviews is going back to this very idea of community. So just to finish, I wanted to make this shout out to winner historians as an inspiring invitation to continue work in, in these directions. And so I brought this, this quote by Janet uh, Winterson, and she says that she must find uh, this, this way, you know, but there's no, no side of sure, only a conviction that what she wanted could exist if she dared to find it. So that's my invitation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina. That was really great. I also see that we already have a question from Mark. So, Mark. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Christina. That's a, that's a very nice. Uh, that's a definitely a very nice uh, presentation. And I was I because of you mentioned about the fact that there are so many citizens in the EU uh, that are detached from the uh, European institutions that are created from the from the derived right law. My question is something that perhaps is, is, is like a focus, right? But 
uh, in the light of the election of the French elections and in the perspective of uh, so it, it, given the the result of the, of the far right which is clearly against the EU although the um, the the manifesto changed in the last election compared with the previous uh, one and given uh, that it is uh, quite likely that in the in the parliament elections that are, are to take place uh, in June, a uh, possibility of a cohabitation is likely if uh, a far left or if uh, or if uh, or if the of, or if Macron is not able to get a majority in parliament in the national assembly regarding the their own party, the La Republican March. Uh, my question is, how do you think that, uh, given um, the weakness of Germany regarding the Ukraine war, uh, which is very important in the EU, and given the problem that France has uh, regarding the far right and the impact of those uh, deputies, those, those members of parliament regarding the French policy, and given that France and Germany are uh, very important from the European uh, Union construction point of view. How do you think that this can affect the detachment of the European citizens regarding these institutions? Yeah, a lot of <laughs> very fundamental questions just in one, so thank you very much for that. I should say that I'm not an expert in French politics, but since this had a, a European dimension, I, I'm very happy to offer <laughs> my point of view. So as you say, the French-German axis has been key for the um, advance, for the moving forward European integration. And the fact that it became fragmented, it's, it's really creating a, a crisis of um, engagement from the point of view of European citizens and, and a crisis of, of cohesion. So I think there are several ingredients in there. You also mentioned the, the rise of the extreme right. And this is something I, I could even see in my own research when I was going to this historical archives of the European Parliament, there was a breaking point. And that was, that coincided in a very interesting way with the war in the Balkans in the 1990s. And it was reinforced by the war um, in Kosovo in 1998. So in the early 90s, um, coinciding with the war in the Balkans, there was this rise of a new group within the European Parliament. First, you had the, the Social Democratic group and the Conservative group. You also had a, a left progressive group that was rising. But at that time, in the, in the early 1990s, you had um, this extreme right new uh, parliamentary group, which uh, and the leader was Le Pen, the father. <laughs> so that was also very significant, I think. And also for all the issues I study, because he tried to impose this idea of uh, the EU's sanguinis, so blood, ethnicity, uh, over the, um, the rise of residency and citizenship to define what makes a European. And I think that it has also something a lot to do with this academy, because I think we are very open in the definition of what makes a European. And that was a very restrictive, very xenophobic and very racist, racist one. So the rise of this third group in the European Parliament, which in many cases started as a punishment vote. And this is something that we can also see in the French elections, is a punishment vote. But <laughs> it just starts as a punishment vote, as a way of protesting against domestic policies, but it has a really impactful result also in, in, in European uh, policy making. And we should never forget that um, European law has preeminence over any national law. So who you place in European institutions at the representative way is really fundamental from that point of view because it has the preeminence of the law. So I, I, I can say that it coincides with the worst and I find it that very interesting. And it, it really breaks the credibility and the legitimacy. But um, at the same time, especially if you think and you, you look back at the so-called debt crisis between 2008 and 2012, and we can even call it an identity crisis, not just a, um, and a multi-level crisis, not just a debt crisis. At that time, there was also a very important criticism of, um, of this troika, of this uh, powerful um, nations or member states like France and Germany and so on, that were taking the decisions disregarding other uh, member states that were considered like poor relatives and 
we saw in the references to Southern Europe, the so-called peaks, if you remember, or also Central and Eastern Europe, um, that were claiming many times that they were being still and again and again considered a second class citizens from many points of view. So I think the, the fact that there was no response to that, the, the creation of, of this core Europe, and that was something very present in the debates in the 1990s at the time of Helmut Kohl, for instance, that there's a core Europe and the core Europe must make the decisions and the others, the, which resulted from different enlargements, the enlargements uh, that were Southern Europe, Central Eastern Europe, they should follow core Europe. But nobody wants to be in the periphery. <laughs> so the problem with European integration, I think, is something I call instrumental peripheries. So when there's a time of um, economic progress and, um, and you need uh, new uh, collaborators for, for an economic project, you encourage this idea that now you're part of the core, now you're part of the club. But at the time of recession, it's like excess baggage. So you are a periphery again. That's why it's like a pendulum like you are an instrumental periphery. And this is an unsolved question. And it has a lot to do with the identity of many citizens and many residents in Europe. So I think that addressing this issue um, uh, of core Europe would be fundamental for the future. And what I see again and again is that it's very similar to psychology. You have these taboos, these questions you never address, you just put them under the carpet and then they explode in your face. So it, it has happened with core Europe and the peripheries, which are instrumental. It has happened with the fortress Europe. There was an early warning that I, I saw many times in my research, like, oh, this is going to explode in our face if we push, if we are going to eliminate internal frontiers of the European Union, but we're going to push very strongly to securitize the external ones. So what are we gonna do in terms of of a migration policy, which does not exist as such. They are just national ones. So I just wanted to, to give you an, an overview, but I think the fragmentation, the issue of not addressing these fundamental questions and just putting them under the carpet really explodes and creates legitimacy, credibility problems and further divides citizens and institutions.